Hey everybody, welcome to Voided Transmissions. I'm your host, Jason Brazier, and I'm very excited to have, uh, well, my second guest on the podcast, Josh Levine. He is the national editor for Slate Magazine, uh, podcaster, journalist, and I mean, I would even say historian by all the digging that you do into history. Uh, Josh, thanks for being here. Thank you so much. And I got equate, you know, familiar with your work as I was I've been driving weekly to a new job, and I've been listening to a lot of podcasts. And I came across Slow Burn, and that podcast is amazing. If anybody hasn't listened to it, please do. But we will definitely touch on Slow Burn here in a few. But you know, what got you interested in journalism? So I studied computer science when I was in college. I was always kind of a math guy. I really liked. Uh, problem solving, logic puzzles, all that sort of stuff when I was a kid. But once it got up to like higher math, uh, other people passed me by with uh, with quickness. Um, but I, I like the problem solving nature of computer science as well, like coding things and kind of coming up with the answer and having it work, I found really satisfying. But it was a pretty solitary sort of pursuit and something that I burned out on. I also was graduating from school uh, when the dot-com bubble burst, so it wasn't the greatest time to find employment in that industry. So I was just thinking about the other stuff I like to do. I always liked history. I studied history in college too, and uh, I also love to write. So uh, I got an internship at the weekly paper here in Washington, D.C., where I live and uh, I really loved it. So if I had gotten a really bad journalism job uh, as my first experience, maybe I would have gone off and tried something else. But fortunately I had a good uh, first job and it all just kind of grew from there. Well, that's, that's great. Well, you know, um, in the last few years, um, cause I mean, I've got a background in journalism as well. I've been a news producer and now I'm a news TV directing the news on TV for TV. But in the last few years, journalism has kind of had a dark shadow fall over it, especially in a post-Trump presidency. Um, from when you began as a journalist to now, what is the biggest difference that you see for journalists in today's world? Well, kind of independent of any sort of political mm -hmm. stuff that you mentioned, just the pace of everything is so much faster. Um, my first job again at the the paper, the Washington City paper here in DC, we put out a print edition every week. Uh, there had to be kind of a big conversation with the bosses about whether to put things online before the paper came out because there was a concern about cannibalizing the print edition, um, wanting to make sure that people picked it up rather than went on the website. Uh, and so moving to Slate after that, which was you know one of the first online only magazines was a big change for me, but Slate itself has changed a huge amount. Um, the pace at which we publish, the volume at which we publish and podcasting didn't exist mm -hmm, mm -hmm. when I started out at Slate. And so just the mediums that we publish and the types of of work that we do. And so that's kind of where my head goes to first. And there's an yeah. expectation from the audience mm -hmm. as well um, to read about things instantaneously. And so there's pressure from within, there's pressure from outside. And, you know, social media also didn't yeah. really exist when I started either. And so that affects how uh, we're read and received as well. Yeah, and I think social media would kind of play a big factor into that because everybody's on their phone 24-7, it seems like. And uh, it's like if you don't have a catchy headline to get their attention in the Twitter feed or, or on Facebook or something, they're not going to look at it. So it's it definitely, I think, I mean, it's added a different 
aspect to getting news or any type of journalistic endeavor out there because you're it's almost like you're you the rules changed and so the journalists in journalism in general just kind of has to adapt or has had to adapt to that and continues to do that but um you know there's a lot of people that i've run into who just um think they all <laughs> and i find it funny so i'm interested in hearing your thoughts on this with how some people just don't say they don't trust journalists and um what do you say to somebody like that who says that journalism is not that important today or that they just don't trust journalists anymore i can understand that i think that um there's a lot of reason to be skeptical of anything that you read no matter where it comes from and so i would modify that a little bit i mean in journalism we're taught um it, it's kind of a cliche in journalism school trust but verify mm -hmm. um so i would tell someone like that yeah you shouldn't accept what you read um at face value necessarily but you should try to read widely and then verify what it is that you read and verification can be a challenge as well um i do think that it's a a little bit like kind of nihilistic to say that i don't trust anything and that at a certain point you have to um just figure out what are the sources and the journalists the institutions the types of information that you do trust so you don't end up having to make that decision you know, a hundred times a day, if you can make it once and then find someone or something that you find reliable, that seems like a more efficient use of your time. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I think that, um, there's a way in which that sort of line can be a, a sort of excuse to just check out entirely. Right. To just wave your hands and say, mm -hmm. I don't know who to trust or what to trust, so I'm just going to disengage, which, uh, you know, I, I just think that it takes work. Like, it takes work to do anything important or valuable that, um, you know, passivity, uh, We, you know, it, it might be nice to live in a world uh, in which you could just read everything and know mm -hmm. that it's true, but we just have to take a more active role as consumers of news and just be more conscious of of what it is that we're reading and consuming and i just think that media literacy is not something that's taught in mm -hmm. schools uh, i think it will be and is being it and is being taught increasingly but i think there's you know generations of people who um weren't necessarily schooled and so we all kind of have to be self-taught which is a challenge yeah and I, do you think that played a lot into when we were in the pandemic with co like in quarantine there was a lot more people that you know were on their phones and on the internet more and it just seems like everything during that time spiked because nobody else had you know anything to do and it seems like people just went down a rabbit hole of certain things when it came to like finding ideology but like not really checking sources because you know we've got these you know conspiracy theories out there now that seem to be running more rampant than usual and i'm curious i mean what do you think um is the catalyst for that do you think i mean obviously media illiteracy but why is it that people have really lean more into conspiracy than trying to actually go after something that seems more factual. So I'm not sure that people go more into conspiracy now than they did in the past. Um, it's, okay. it's true that um, there's more conspiracy laden material available for people to consume now than in the past, just because there's more of everything available. But I mean, if we get to slow burn, in yes. the first season that Leon Nafok hosted on Watergate, there was a whole yes. episode about all of the conspiracy theories around 
Watergate. There were obviously, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, some people date the kind of birth of modern conspiracy culture to the JFK assassination. Um, mm -hmm. And so there's been a kind of ripe and fru fruitful history of conspiracy minded thinking in this country and, and elsewhere for generations and around health stuff in particular. I mean, we did a an episode that my colleague Evan Chung hosted on the One Year podcast about mm -hmm. a conspiracy around Laetrile, uh, which was supposedly a cancer cure, which was just quack medicine in the 70s. Mm -hmm. So I, I th also think there's a kind of misunderstanding about how misinformation works. I think a lot of times what happens is that people have pre-existing beliefs and then consume media that affirms those beliefs yeah. rather than people coming in with a totally open mind. I think it does happen in both ways. Like I, I think there are ways that like the YouTube algorithm, for instance, or other online algorithms will get people on dark pathways that they maybe wouldn't have gone down themselves. But I also feel like when people have a germ of an idea, they can just find article or video or podcast after article and video and podcast that just tells them that they're right. Um, so that's, I think, a hard pathway to to get off of. Yeah, I mean, that those echo chambers are definitely, you know, and you're, I mean, you are right. I mean, conspiracy theories have always been around. It just seems like since COVID-19, it seems like it's, what's the word I'm looking for? It's not, you know, it's always been, but now it's just loud. Yeah, I think that we were also, um, separated from human contact in, in a lot of ways. And so a lot of people were looking for mm -hmm. connection online or um, being fed by their phones uh, in a way that, that maybe wasn't the case in, in 2019 or 2018. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're definitely right that something is different. I'm just not sure whether it's difference in degree and volume or whether it's a difference in the actual um, kind of, of nature of what was going on. Yeah. And I think, you know, it makes me wonder too. I mean, it could be a combination of things, you know, and it's, it's, I find it fascinating just how, um, you know, like, I mean, I mean, there's the, I mean, we said something about, you said something about JFK earlier. I mean, recently there were people who were in, Dallas here a month some months back that were waiting for JFK Jr. to appear and announced that he was running as Trump's running mate or something to that effect but it was not just like a small group of people it was a giant crowd and it's just you know I, I also wonder if there's like they don't some people may not even want I don't want to say they don't want the truth but it's not what they had planned, like when people are telling them. And so when they get down these conspiracy rabbit holes, it just seems to me that it's not about the it's, it's, it's for some reason, like maybe it's about hope, like they're hoping for something greater to happen than what's actually happening. And maybe that's where that might play into it. I don't have the answer either. I mean, it's, it's, it's all observational at this point, but. Well, these uh, patterns of thinking are more. I think akin to religious thinking than, uh, you know, a, a lot of mm -hmm. views that can't be verified or don't seem based on facts. It, it's, yeah, it's more along the lines of, of kind of spiritual thinking than, than journalistic. Yeah, no, I, I can agree there too. And I think that's why a lot of them, a lot of people, whenever they bring up something like, that may be based on have some religious basis for the way they're thinking that it's like whenever you question it or, or say, well, I, it's like, okay, I hear what you're saying, but what about this? And you can present them with a fact and it's like, no, you're questioning, you know, it's like they, if you, if you ask them, it's like you're there, you're automatically questioning their faith and they just don't want to listen to it when you're not really trying to do that, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. And we did lots of episodes, a couple episodes that touched on, misinformation and conspiracy thinking in our one year 1942 yes, series yes. as well. So, I mean, it's a kind of age old 
question and the fact that we're still talking about it attests to the persistence of well, the, these phenomena. Yeah, well, and you know, it, now that we're talking about a little bit about history too, history seems to kind of re- I don't know if it's repeat itself, but I think it's always it always echoes. <laughs> um, but for instance, you know, now we're dealing it again. Well, it's always been around, but it's become prominent again with um, all the anti-Semitism. And I've been seeing stuff for the last six months, whenever I was working as a, even as a news producer, Pete with these people bringing up stuff that um, it was the protocols of the elders of Zion. I don't know if you've uh, heard of that, but it was, Mm -hmm. there was, it was basically something that um, was made back during world war one, I believe. And these, it was propaganda and it was proven wrong, obviously, but it's, it was said, oh, they found this on a Jewish soldier's, you know, dead body, and it had their entire plan. And some of the stuff they were laying out in the, in the, back in this is some of the same talking points that are still being used today, like the adrenochrome and all the trafficking of children. And what – and I have to ask, you know, when it comes to history kind of echoing or repeating itself, what is it – why do we – as human beings hold on to certain things that may have been proven to be not right, but we still want to hold, they still, people still want to hold on to those things like white supremacy, which will be a great segue into David Duke here in a second. Yeah. I, on the sports podcast that I do hang up and listen, we are talking about this um, with respect to Kyrie Irving, who's been the most kind of prominent recent popularizer of, um, these sort of anti-Semitic slanders and, and myths. And it's just funny to me that people who call themselves free thinkers, um, they just often, and especially when it comes to anti-Semitism, just rely on the same lies and slanders and conspiracies that people have been talking about for millennia. Um, there's nothing original about it. And you know what it comes down to is people wanting someone to blame for either their personal issues or for the larger problems of the world. And the people that tend to get blamed are underrepresented groups and minority groups. And then the other thing that I would say is that, um, you know, when things are disproven, that often can make them more alluring because it's the idea of forbidden knowledge. It's what they don't want you to know. It's what they don't want you to hear about or think about. So, oh, it must be true if people are saying it's false, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And then that gets you into a a situation where these things are impossible to eradicate if the the attempt to eradicate them makes them uh, more alluring. I guess it's like the Streisand effect, uh, uh, which is the phenomenon of you know, when you try to erase something from the internet, it just draws more attention to it. Interesting. So I guess too, I mean, it would have to be like, you know, how do journalists battle that? Because if it's like you're presenting two plus two equals four and you've got a hundred people saying, no, this has been a lie and it equals five. I mean, it's kind of like, how do you, how do you do, how do you challenge that? How do you overcome that? There are certain people who, if something's in the New York Times, they'll assume that it's uh, a lie, right? And I think that it's probably asking too much of journalists to convince those people. Um, And I think what we can do is present the truth or what we believe to be the truth based on our reporting um, in a way that Um, shows our work so that people who either are already inclined to believe what we're writing or people who do genuinely have an open mind can read a story or listen to a story with confidence that it's true and also um, then show it to someone or point someone to it and say, yeah, this is true because... um, they got this person or they have this document. Um, And so I I do think showing your work is important. 
I think that there are people that are persuadable, but I also feel like if the goal is to convince everyone, then you're always going to fail. If the goal is to convince even 70% of people, you're probably always going to fail. And so I, I just think that we have to be realistic mm-hmm. about um, who the potential audience is and what we're able to do with the tools that are available to us and the times that we live in. Very true. Well, we were talking, and that's very well said, because it's, it's, you know, it's, even if you just try to focus on, like, I'll just, I'm just putting this out there just for whoever is willing to listen. You know, it's like, I think, like, you'll get more traction in that, going that avenue than sitting there trying to say, I'm going to change everybody's mind, because that is unrealistic. Um, I mean, there have been lots of examples of uh, stories where (laughs) someone will be like, yeah, I've, I've voted for a Democrat before, but like they just really haven't persuaded me this time. And so I'm going to have to vote Republican. And then people will like reveal like this person is like a conservative political consultant or like uh, Mm -hmm. there's a a way that people kind of present themselves as persuadable who actually aren't. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. and, And so, yeah, it's, it's maybe sad to, think this way but um there's just you're not going to be able to convince everyone of anything true well this is a good segue going into your uh, your season of slow burn about david duke and i'll be honest at first when i saw that i was like man i know this is going to be kind of heavy <laughs> and i was like do i really want to do i want to take this on And then I thought to myself, you know what? No, I need to understand this stuff because this stuff comes up. And so what was it that made you want to cover David Duke for those who haven't heard the podcast yet? Well, the part that you need to include is once you started listening, you were like, this is amazing. I have to keep going. (laughs) And and it's not a chore. And it's not like homework. It's just like a really entertaining listen. No, it was. And I'll be completely honest with everybody, whoever's listening. I tweeted you and slate saying i just finished listening to this i'm a josh levine fan (laughs) i mean i was enthralled by it like i was actually like it was kind of like watching a netflix episode you know you're like "Ah, i'm just gonna watch one episode and then next thing you know you're eight episodes in and it's like oh i've oh it's I, i need to go to bed at some point you know but it did draw me in it was really good and you it's very much like you know it's an audio documentary and the way that you structured everything is what, and with each episode is what really makes it interesting. And so what was it that made you really want to cover him? Because, I mean, yeah, he obviously is a controversial figure, and he has come up. Um, his name has come up quite a lot in the past, past few years. Uh, thank you for allowing me to fish for compliments. Um, <laughs> so uh, I grew up with, with that guy as a kind of looming specter in my childhood and I had a feeling of confusion about the whole thing just as I think a lot of people did. I had a a sort of childlike understanding of the Duke phenomenon um, just as a Jewish kid in New Orleans, just like, wow, this guy seems really bad. Why is he getting um, this many votes from people who live in my community? Um, and then kind of sense of relief when he didn't get elected statewide. So it's something that uh, was just always kind of lurking either in my conscious or subconscious. And then once I became a journalist and have both the tools, but also the platform Mm -hmm. to be able to be like nosy about it and ask people like what Mm -hmm. the deal with this was, I was just really curious. I wanted to understand it for myself. And then, yeah, he's somebody whose ideas have a lot of currency today. And so it's not just an academic exercise. It feels important to understand not necessarily him in particular, but people like him and ideas like his. Why and how do they uh, proliferate? And how did 
the people who confronted him in the late 80s and early 90s go about that? And to the extent they succeeded, how did they succeed? Yeah, well, and something that I found interesting, though, was like, why do you think there were so many people that did want to vote for him? Because I remember there being interviews that you guys should, would, you know, you had in the ser- in that series where people were just like, didn't care that he was a white supremacist or whatever. They be- they were believing that he would fight for certain things and they were willing to throw that one part of his l- life that was a very, very prominent thing and very, very bad. And they didn't want to talk about it or worry about it. I mean, why do you think people did that because for, for him? I think that um, there's a bunch of different types of Duke voters. There were the kind that um, liked his clan affiliation and, and Nazism that voted for him affirmatively because of that. Mm-hmm. There are the kind who understood that that was something that he had believed, but thought erroneously that it was in his past and mm-hmm. just found him um, to be compelling for other reasons, um, I suppose. And then there's a group that was not naive, that understood who he was, that I think didn't vote for him affirmatively because of it, but ultimately didn't care, that wanted a Republican, wanted someone who would slash social programs that um, benefited Black people in Louisiana and the United States um, to some degree, that um, just wanted lower taxes or whatever it is that he was promoting that was not um, specifically about Black people and Jewish people. So I just think that it's not one answer. It would probably be Everybody had easier to find it. solution yeah. if there was just yeah one answer. Um, but yeah, he was also telegenic. I mean, he was um, telling people what they wanted to hear. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so yeah, yeah, he he was uh, a phenomenon. Well, and there were some things too that I found very interesting when he was running for office. It seems like do you do you. See, did, did you see any parallels with some of today's political figures that were controversial political figures? I'll be more specific that kind of echo the way he ran t- as well with, you know, not attacking and really trying to turn it back on. If like, if a journalist asked him something, he wouldn't attack them. It seemed like, and, but he would try to put it back on them. Like they were the bad guy. I mean, there are similarities to him and Trump and also, uh, I think, some key differences. But he definitely attacked and and vilified the press. We have tape from the Victory Party when he won his state rep race. Mm -hmm. And he was attacking the Times-Picayune, the local paper that had written pieces critical of him. And the crowd sounded... Like it was out for blood. Like they wanted to just destroy mm-hmm. this this newspaper. That they were the enemy, the the kind of common enemy that brought everyone together. Um, we also have tape of him saying at a rally that he was going to make America great again. This idea that um, there was some mythical past in America that it was a fallen country, um, you know, and his view, um, whether he said it more explicitly sometimes than others, but the idea that the civil rights movement had um, given Black Americans too many rights and too much leeway, um, Mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, that just this this idea that white people were being discriminated against. Um, he started the National Association for the Advancement of White People, which okay. sounds which sounds like a joke, but is a real thing. Like that's no, the thing that he did after he left the Klan. 
whenever I heard that in the podcast, I my I was like, oh my god, <laughs> um, that just it was you know it was shocking, but at the same time, it wasn't surprising if that makes sense. Um, yeah, I mean, it's some of it is similar to what politicians do, but a lot of it is like kind of online trolls. I mean, how many times? Have you heard people say like, "Why is there no White History Month?" I mean, he was the kind of pioneer uh, of that of of stuff like that of just like dumb rhetorical points mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. sounds smart if you're a racist. With that, with even talking about him, you know, there seems to be a lot of more figures even as well. Have Have you ever heard of Gerald L. K. Smith? I don't think I have, or the name doesn't ring a bell. I, oh, okay. You will have a field day with this. <laughs> um, look him up. He was the founder of the Great Passion Play in Arkansas and the giant Jesus statue that's in Arkansas. Uh -huh. But he was a renowned um, anti Semitic. He was, um, if, I, if I recall, I think, if I recall correctly, I think he was, um, well, was, you know, basically very well-known populist for his far right, very, very far right views. And he's the one that coined the term make America great again. And this mm -hmm. was back in the fifties. And a lot of his stuff that he has done, it, it just it, like with listening to your podcast on Duke, it's just it, it, all these echoes of stuff getting passed down and I'm just, I don't know, I'm just curious, like with Duke, what can we learn from his runs for political office and how can, because I know there's no way to really, I don't want to say, you know, we want to, you know, beat, we want to beat the white supremacists and that type of ideology, but now that they're all running for office it seems like they've traded their hoods in for um, a suit and tie <laughs> more than anything to be more appealing to everybody and i'm curious just with how the political atmosphere is today what can we learn from history like with people like david duke ran for office well i think one important thing is to identify the historical through line because if you're not familiar um and I appreciate, you know, learning what you just taught me there. So if you're not familiar mm -hmm. with history and historical patterns, you're going to think that what you're living through is unique and has never happened mm -hmm. before. And you might not recognize the lessons that have been learned from the past about people like David Duke, who learned a lot from George Wallace, um, you know, when he was kind of coming into his own. That was a figure that most Americans would have been familiar with mm -hmm. and most Americans now would not be. And so it, part of what I think I try to do in my work is just bring things to light. Like that's the first step towards understanding. And also I think not trying to like I learned something from what um, you just told me, but um, you weren't going into that anecdote explicitly being like, I'm going to teach you something. Like, uh, I, I think it's important mm -hmm. for people to read or listen to things and draw their own conclusions. Like I didn't tell, or I didn't, I try not to tell people what to take away or what to think. Um, yeah, you're, you're just kind of laying it out there. It's like, okay, this is what I have found and put together. You try to do it in an artful or, way. Or, and and, yeah, I, and, yeah. I, and, I, and I have my own thoughts, but I just think that people are going, myself included, are going to end up having stronger takeaways and convictions if they come to them themselves rather than being told what to think. What? So I, I think that's, part of it. Um, mm -hmm. And I think um, the other thing is, you know, one of the lessons from Duke's political rise 
is that ignoring him didn't work. Um, mm -hmm. Starving him of oxygen once... It, it's a tricky thing because when somebody doesn't have any kind of a platform, you don't want to give them one. Mm -hmm. But once somebody is a, a reasonably successful candidate for a higher office, um, mm -hmm. ignoring them, deplatforming them, starving them of oxygen when they're like literally running for governor is like, it's not an effective strategy. Um, mm -hmm. And so when the Times Picayune, when in that runoff, made a decision to devote just an enormous amount of resources to exposing Duke's lies, that was hugely uh, significant and had a, an impact. Um, so I just think you have to be really thoughtful in the way that you write about and publicize these figures and there's not any sort of playbook necessarily, but um, I, I just think that sometimes there's not enough thought put into what the effects, what, what kind of coverage is being done and what the effects of that coverage are. Yeah, it's kind of like, you know, sometimes going for the jugular is not the most effective way because then people are looking at the blood and blood is what kind of <laughs> sells, you know, so even if you're trying to get to... I don't want to say kill a an ideal or something like that. Sometimes it that makes it grow even more, um, and so it's you know and ta still talking about history and with Duke and everything. You you have a newer podcast that we, you've mentioned a couple of times, um, and it's uh, one year. And uh, what what is it with that podcast that made you want to do it? So with Slow Burn, uh, we've done. In addition to the Duke story, uh, there was a series about Watergate, about the Clinton impeachment, about yes, Biggie yes. and Tupac, about the Iraq War, uh, about LA Roe v. Wade, about the LA riots. Yeah, so yep. mm -hmm. um, these episodic narrative series that take on these pretty sweeping events. And so I wanted to bring the same kind of deep reporting and thinking that we put into that show mm -hmm. into a different type of series, an anthology series, which um, tells a bunch of different kind of stories and in a more kind of kaleidoscopic way so that you get the sense of what it was like to live in America in a given year, but through sports and politics and culture and science and religion and um mm -hmm. and through stories that are funny and that are life or death and so it was it's fun for me just as um someone who likes to learn things and mm -hmm. and talk to people and do this kind of research to be able to tell all of those different kinds of stories but i also think with my <laughs> sort of of mission of showing rather than telling and and creating this sort of um you know canvas or, or landscape that people can look at and draw their own conclusions from just having all of these different types of stories um just felt like a really good way to give people um an ambient sense of just what the world was like at a given time yeah, and I like that too because it also it gives you more perspective rather than just like maybe a few. I mean, you're going from so many different angles that you may not even have thought about, and I think that's what makes that um, series um, enjoyable. And I have just started listening to it actually because I'm still catching up on Slow Burn, <laughs> um, but I really wanted to make sure we touched on that because it is really good. And I've um, the first, and I think the first season was 1942. So. Uh, 77, 1977 was, um, the first series, the, that's the, fir right. the first one in your feed, because it's the most recent one would be 1942. So we've that's, done, that's what it is. That's yeah. Yeah. We've done 1977, 1995, 1986 and 1980, uh, 1942. So I, um, I just, I also really like to tell unfamiliar stories and to try to 
um, bring stuff to light that people may, might not know about. And the I, I love the reaction of like when people say something in response uh, to a story. Like I can't I can't believe I didn't know that. So uh, yeah, this this gives me a lot of opportunities to tell stories like that. What uh, what story comes to mind? Well, I'm a huge sports guy like i do a weekly sports mm -hmm. show uh, that was kind of my entree into journalism i'm just know i know a lot about sports present and, and past and for our first season on 1977 i told a sports story that i didn't know um, it's a baseball story that baseball fans didn't know it's a chicago baseball story it's a story that like most chicago baseball fans didn't know but oh, it's really? not it's not like a small story it's a really big story which is the story of the first woman who got a legitimate shot to be um a sportscaster essentially a play-by-play -play sportscaster and her name was mary shane and she called chicago white Sox games alongside harry carey who's the most famous mm -hmm. yeah absolutely. maybe except for vin scully most famous baseball uh -huh. broadcaster ever um and the story of how she got that job, how she got the job taken away from her and what happened to her after um, was totally fascinating. And we got the people closest to her to tell that story um, for the first time. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, we've we've told a bunch that was a, a, a kind of a more personal, you know, small, mm -hmm. smaller in some way, because it's about one person and one job. Um, but it told a really deep and important story about um, well, yeah, what was the going late seventies, yeah, yeah, yeah. in in all sorts of realms of American life, women were getting unprecedented opportunities professionally, um, and this was a case study in that. And what what often happened to pioneers, women who were getting these opportunities, and it wasn't um, all kind of uh, rosy when they got there. Uh, that's uh, that's great. I, <laughs> and, and what season was that on? That was the nineteen seventy seven season. Nineteen seventy seven season. Okay, I like the, to that's the, the one I haven't listened to yet. I mean, definitely check that out. And the episode is called Mary Shane's Rookie Season. That's awesome because, like, I, I like you. I like to learn about things, and I'm a documentarian too. And like, I just did a film called The Flying Greek, and it was about a guy where I. And, in Springfield, Missouri, that was a jeweler, but in the 60s and 70s, he was a world-renowned professional wrestler and traveled with Andre the Giant, of all people. That's great. And I was just like, why do I, I'm an unapologetic wrestling fan, and so I'm sitting here going, how did I not know about this guy, you know? And just hearing his stories and learning, and just getting this different perspective on a guy who came from Rhodes, Greece, and living in the middle of the Ozarks, like, how'd you get here? And why? You know, it's... It's a fascinating tale, and I always tell people too. Sometimes, doing documentaries and what or whatever, it's not about what you know; it's about wanting to know more. And I think that's what has made both Slow Burn one of my favorite series, and um, in a you know, is it what is it's one year, is it, or is it in a year? I know I'm saying it wrong. One year. That's one right. year. That's one year. Okay, I kept on saying in my head. I was like, is it in a year? No, it has to be one year. <laughs> and uh, that's what makes those series so good is that I know I'm going to go in and hear something or a different perspective that I haven't heard. And I always think that's important because I always walk out. I like to walk out of things saying, I didn't know that I didn't, hadn't thought of it that way because I think that's how people grow and learn more. And I think that's with what you guys are doing at slate, especially with those podcasts and everything you guys are doing. I think that's what makes it uh, very, really, 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 really great um and do you have any other projects coming up we're continuing uh both those series slow burn and one year so i'm going to be working on those in 2023 and uh yeah that's uh enough for now i and i do the the weekly uh sports show hang up and listen so just doing a bunch of different types of audio projects some behind the scenes some um where i'm the host and since you mentioned wrestling the, mm -hmm. <laughs> i i thought i would yeah. mention uh -huh. i'm not i'm not a wrestler i didn't grow up watching That's wrestling okay. yeah. but one yeah. of the uh 
my favorite stories that I ever edited when I was doing more print editing was uh-huh. when Ronald Reagan died. Uh, my friend Dave McKenna, who writes for Defector now, did a piece for Slate where he talked to all of the uh, Russian wrestlers who made a living off of the Cold War uh-huh. and just them expressing their gratitude for Reagan. Uh, <laughs> Like yeah. Nikolai, Nikolai Volkov and Nikolai these, Volkov, yep. These these people, uh, which it's just an example of like looking for uh, a weird angle. Like I think probably nobody yep. else when Reagan died thought to interview Nikolai Volkov, but that was the story I wanted to read. Yeah, well, that's what's very, and what's funny is the Manoli. Uh, he actually just passed away about a week ago. Um, but oh he, man, uh, I'm sorry. Oh, it's you know it, it, he'd been fighting colon cancer for about a year, and so. I got to know him really well, so it's um, and got close to his family. But some of the stories he he knew Nikolai Volkov, you know, he knew a lot of these wrestlers mm-hmm. back then. And so hearing, just hearing stories like, you know, he would mention he even wrestled Randy Savage, Macho Man, back in the day before he became known as Macho Man. And he had he was playing baseball, and he was told he couldn't wrestle, so he wanted to wrestle, and he was putting on a lucha libre wrestling mask so nobody knew who he was, <laughs> and so Creative. he. Yeah, and so he in Manoli wrestled him. He was he was known as Mike Pappas, the Flying Greek, and so it's just fascinating hearing stories like that because a lot of people don't realize how big wrestling still is to this day and how big it was back in the day and how for sure people still identify with some of those characters because there was a lot going on, like with Sergeant Slaughter during the um, um, Desert the Storm, War, yeah. the Gulf War, and Desert Storm. He ended up switching sides to be the bad guy, and he was with uh, the Iron Sheik and all those guys. And so he became a bad guy, a heel, because that's what people was that's what was going on in the world, and that's what they kind of fed into. But anyway, I could go on for wrestling for hours. But <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, uh, John, again, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. I really do appreciate it. Um, this is I could talk to you for hours about this stuff. I love learning and hearing. <laughs> your stories and how you're uh, doing this and that. And I also wanted to touch base too. I saw that you, did you write a book as well? Yeah. I wrote a book called the queen, which was based on an article that I wrote for slate about the woman who, uh, whose life story was used by Reagan um, to kind of create and further the myth of the welfare queen. So it was her life story. Um, in print for the first time. And we also did a limited podcast series also called The Queen um, about Linda Taylor. Uh, so yeah, that was a project that took up most of the 2010s for me. So the book came out in 2019. Did it? Okay, well, I'm glad it did. And where can people find that book if they want to read it? Uh, wherever fine books are sold. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Good, good, good. And the, you said there's a podcast too, and it's, it's also called The Queen? Or that is, that is correct. Okay, cool. Well, check that out, guys. Again, Josh, thank you for being here, and you've been listening to Voided Transmissions. <laughs>